war was waged at the great synod of Dort in 1618, 1619. Although there was a political element involved at the synod, the war wasn't over territory or resources, but it was a war for the everlasting inheritance of the truth of the sovereign grace of God in salvation. It was a war for the gospel. It was a war for the preservation of the church and the everlasting well-being of the souls of men and women and children. On the one side of the battlefield were the soldiers of Arminianism, a theological position about which the soldiers on the other side of the battlefield said, it came out of hell. This is that old Pelagian error brought out of hell. This was war. Opposite the soldiers of the Arminians on the other side of the battlefield were the soldiers of the theology of what was called the Confession and the Catechism of the Belgic Churches. That is the theology that has its origin in the Scriptures. The theology that came down from heaven. The theology of the sovereign grace of God in salvation. In order to understand and appreciate the war of 1618-1619, you really ought to read if you have not done so already, the historical foreword that was appended to the Acts of Synod, describing the history leading up to the Synod. And also you ought to read Professor Kuyper's summary of the work of each session of the Synod. And these two sources can be found on the Dort 400 website. The Synod convened in 1618 and Jacob Arminius, who was at the center of the controversy, he was ordained into the gospel ministry in Amsterdam in 1588. So the period of time from the ordination of Arminius to the convening of the National Synod was 30 years. There was, for a period of at least 30 years in the Dutch churches, unrest. At least 30 years of unrest. There was trouble before Arminius. There were reformed preachers controverting the doctrine of predestination taught by Calvin and Beza, and they were objecting to the binding authority of the confessions. However, the trouble intensified when the more capable and more influential Arminius came and was ordained into the ministry and was sympathetic to these other ministers started undermining the doctrine of election and asserting that the natural will of the natural man is good. However, there was a crisis in the Reformed churches when Arminius was appointed seminary professor in Leiden and started spreading his views among the students. In 1609, we heard this last night, Arminius died. Many thought that was the end of the controversy Peace would be restored, but that did not happen. More trouble was coming as the disciples of Arminius came and they advanced his doctrine and they carefully formulated it in 1610 into what we now know as the five articles of the Remonstrance. During this time, there were many Arminian preachers in the churches. There were brazen attacks against the confessions and there was all kinds of subterfuge and lies and deceit. You can read this in the historical foreword. The Arminian preachers refused to explain their concerns, their reservations they had with the confessions. Finally, a national synod in 1618 to weigh and to judge the theology of Arminianism and it was war. Although, as we just heard, the Arminians came to the Synod trying to convince the delegates that this was a conference at which, and in a brotherly spirit, they were going to discuss their theological differences. The Arminians knew it was war. All of the delegates knew it was war between two irreconcilable and hostile positions. 
the Armenians were evasive. They were deceptive. And that because they knew it was war. And they did not want to be condemned and face ecclesiastical censure at the synod. Everyone knew it was war. When you read through the foreword and study the history leading up to the synod and at the synod itself, <clears throat> then as a reformed believer, you become exasperated and infuriated with the Arminians. If you so despise, and they despise the doctrine of election, sovereign particular election, and the accompanying decree of reprobation, if you so despise predestination, just be honest. Say so. Why all this devilish maneuvering in and troubling of God's precious church? At the Great Synod, five canons were assembled and used as the mighty weapon of God to bring down the Arminian strongholds in the Church of Jesus Christ. By canon, of course, we're not referring to a loud, large, smoking cylinder for the hurling of physical projectiles across enemy lines, but to an ecclesiastical rule a standard, an official doctrinal statement written out. The synod formulated and the synod then warred a good warfare with the canons of Dort. They warred that kind of warfare unto which the young pastor Timothy had been exhorted by the inspired apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1 verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. The synod vindicated the holy name of God, the holy gospel of God, and restored a measure of peace and unity to the churches and gave to us who are gathered here 400 years later an enduring monument of theological struggle that defines the sole comforting truth that all of salvation is of God. The theme for the speech this morning is war and a good warfare with the canons. I want to look at two points. Most of the time will be spent considering the first point, rejecting error, and second, defining truth. With the canons, the synod rejected Arminianism as error. The distinctive feature of the canons, as every Reformed believer knows, is that as a confessional statement, it includes two sections in each of its five chapters or heads. So that in each chapter there's a positive statement of the truth, and then that's followed by a rejection of error. For example, in Head 1, which is called Of Divine Predestination, the canons give 18 articles positively stating the truth of predestination and then a rejection of errors. I'd like you to take out your Psalters for just a moment and turn to the canons. Turn to the fifth head, the last, the fifth chapter. Every chapter has two sections. Head 5. After the 15th article, we read this. The true doctrine having been explained, the synod rejects the errors of those. Now turn back to heads 3 and 4. Halfway through, after the 17 articles positively stating the truth, same statement. The true doctrine having been explained, the synod rejects the errors of those. Turn to head two. <clears throat> after article nine, same statement. The true doctrine having been explained, the synod rejects the errors of those and now back to head one, after 18 articles, 
a slightly different statement. The true doctrine, and now a statement of what that true doctrine was, the true do doctrine concerning election and rejection having been explained, the synod rejects the errors of those. I simply point that out and in a few moments we'll come back to that statement. The Synod warred a good warfare with the canons by explicitly identifying Arminianism as error. The term error is biblical. It is found, for example, in 1 John 4, verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. There are two kinds of spirits. There is the spirit of truth, and then there is the spirit of error. The spirit of error. Error is departure from the truth. Error is not the truth. Error is against the truth. The Synod of Dort warred a good warfare with the canons when the Synod looked at Arminianism and the Synod declared about that theological position on the other side of the battlefield Error, not truth, against the truth, not of God, not for God, against God, not right, wrong. Notice then what the canons do not say of Arminianism. First of all, the canons do not identify Arminianism as a different way of expressing the truth. The Arminians insisted that they were orthodox. They insisted that they were brethren in the churches, that their differences were in non-essentials, that their differences were merely a matter of terminology and therefore should be tolerated in the churches. They couldn't understand why anyone would object to their teachings and make a fuss about their teachings. The Arminians hated nothing more than predestination, the sovereign decree of God. But they said that they believed in election. They used the term election. They came into the pulpit and they preached sermons on election. Even as they used the terms faith and grace, but they poured new meanings into the terms. And so they started generating sympathy from the people in the pews because the people heard sermons on election. And they said, these men, they may have different formulations of the truth, but fundamentally, they are orthodox. We just heard a sermon on election. A conference was held in Delft in 1613 bringing three representatives from each side together so that in a brotherly spirit they could discuss their differences. In the historical foreword, we read that the Arminians, quote, said that the articles which were in question were of such little importance that they did not concern the fundamentals of salvation and that in the case of such kind of articles of doctrine, People ought to be tolerant, end quote. And many were sympathetic to the Arminians. Even today, when many take out the five articles of the Remonstrance and read them, they do not immediately respond, this is blatantly egregious, gross heresy. But the first response is, war was waged over these five statements, they don't sound that bad. The Arminians were careful to sound reformed and they insisted that they believed the truth. They had only a different way of expressing the truth. Referring to the tactic of the Arminians, the Presbyterian theologian Samuel Miller said of heretics in general, quote, but when taxed with deviations from the received faith, they complain of the unreasonableness of their accusers as they differ from it only in words. This has been the standing course of errorists 
ever since the apostolic age, end quote. The Synod of Dort warred a good warfare with the canons when the Synod looked at Arminianism and said, error. In identifying it as error, the Synod was expressing its conviction that the difference between Arminianism and the Orthodox confessional reformed faith was not mere quibbling about words or acceptable phrases as if each side had the truth, the Arminians only having a different way of expressing the truth. The Synod said, error. Secondly, the canons do not identify Arminianism as doctrinal confusion. Arminianism is confusion. Necessarily, Arminianism is confusion because Arminianism is error. And error is departure from the clear word of God. And as soon as one makes a departure from the clear word of God, one immediately enters into murky and increasingly murkier waters. Deliberately, Arminianism is confusion as the goal of errors is always to disguise the error. Consider only the doctrine of election as taught by the Arminians according to, head one of the canons, rejection of errors two, the Arminian doctrine of election condemned by the synod. Quote, who teach that there are various kinds of election of God unto eternal life, the one general and indefinite, the other particular and definite, and that the latter in turn is either incomplete, revocable, non-decisive, and conditional, or complete, irrevocable, decisive, and absolute. Likewise, that there is one election unto faith and another unto salvation, so that election can be unto justifying faith without being a decisive election unto salvation. Now just imagine being a catechism student with your notebook and pen. And you come to catechism to hear instruction from an Arminian catechism teacher on the doctrine of election. And now you're learning there are various kinds of election. One is general and indefinite, and there's another that is particular and definite. One is incomplete, another complete. One is revocable, another irrevocable, and so on. And what does that all mean? And if the question were asked on a test, what is election? What is the student supposed to answer? What is election? The Orthodox Reformed pastor likely introduces the doctrine of election to the children of the church who are about 10 or so years of age, maybe fourth or fifth grade, when teaching the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul and how according to Acts 13, verse 48, as many as were ordained unto eternal life believed. <clears throat> Paul went to the city and preached. Some believed. Many believed. Who believed? As many as were ordained to eternal life. The simple fundamental idea of election can be taught children. God's eternal plan whereby He chooses whom He will save and He gives them faith. Simple. A child can understand it. There's not a seminary professor who can understand the Arminian idea of election with all of its distinctions. Arminianism is doctrinal confusion, but the Synod did not say that Arminianism is doctrinal confusion. The Synod said it's wrong. It's error. You see, it's possible to be an Orthodox preacher who believes the truth, but at the same time, <clears throat> to be 
a very poor preacher who makes the truth confusing so that the people leave the sanctuary saying, I don't understand what was the main point of the sermon. It was all muddled together. He didn't follow a clear line. Everything that he said is true. But I don't understand what was the point. The Arminians were not like that. They were not orthodox preachers who believed the truth and who simply made the truth confusing with ambiguous expressions and convoluted explanations and illogical presentations. To look at Arminianism and say merely it is doctrinal confusion or it is a kind of confusion that could potentially lead to error is not war in a good warfare. The synod warred a good warfare with the canons when the synod examined Arminianism and declared error. Not truth. Against truth. Not of God. Not for God. Against God. Not right. But wrong. Error. Having identified Arminianism as error, the synod took the only appropriate course of action before the face of the God whom they labored. Now back to that statement in the middle of head one. The true doctrine concerning election and rejection having been explained, the synod rejects the errors of those. Who's the subject of the verb elects? God. And who's the subject of the verb rejects? God. God elects. God rejects. That's predestination. Head one. God rejects. And now the synod has said of Arminianism, this is error. And they're laboring consciously before the face of God. The God who, doesn't matter why, no matter how, before the God who rejects. Now, this is error. The only proper course of action was to reject the error. And the Synod did that explicitly in the Canons of Dort and subsequently censured the errorists. Notice four characteristics of the Synod's rejection of the error. First of all, the Synod warred a good warfare with the Canons when the Synod rejected the error of Arminianism authoritatively. There's no confession like the canons of Dort. There are other confessions that have biblical texts incorporated into them or many, many, many texts appended as footnotes, but there's no confession like the canons of Dort which is incorporate, has incorporated into it so many biblical quotations and citations and strikingly, most of them come in the second section, the rejection of of errors, not on the authority of a persuasive Bogerman, not on the authority of a persuasive Gomaris, but on the authority of the Word of God. Synod rejected Arminianism. We ought not misunderstand the appeal to Scripture rather than appeal to the two Reformed confessions of that day for the rejection of Arminianism. We ought not misunderstand that as a concession to the Arminians who were against the creeds and wanted to revise the creeds and did not want to be bound by the creeds, nor was the synod being reluctant or hesitant to use the creeds. First of all, the states general mandated that whatever decisions the synod made, they must be made on the basis of Scripture. But secondly, the synod itself expressed its commitment to the two Reformed confessions when they drew up the conclusion to the canons and stated, quote, this doctrine the Synod judges to be drawn from the Word of God and to be agreeable to the confessions of the Reformed churches, end quote. And then additionally, in drawing up the formula of subscription, the Synod called the canons, quote, an explanation of some points of the aforesaid doctrine, referring back, of course, to the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. The Synod believed that the doctrine formulated in the canons was not new. It was the doctrine of the two existing Reformed 
confessions simply explaining further that doctrine. So standing on the authority of Scripture, and then with their eye on the two confessions, and the Arminians did not want their eye on the two confessions, but standing on the authority of Scripture, and with their eye on the two Reformed confessions, synod rejected Arminianism authoritatively. Secondly, the Synod warred a good warfare with the canons by rejecting the Arminian error comprehensively. The canons demonstrate that the Synod clearly understood that Arminianism is not merely a collection of some stray statements. It is a system We speak of a solar system, and we are referring to that massive interconnected network at the center of which is the sun, and all of these bodies orbiting the sun and forming one united whole, solar system. So we have the Calvinistic system of salvation, as it would be formulated in the Canons of Dort. It's a system. And the sun at the center of that system is the sovereign, gracious will of God. And all of salvation with all of its elements revolves around God and His sovereign, gracious will. He is at the center. Arminianism is a system. And though the Arminians would disagree to this, in the final analysis, everything revolves around the will of man. What is election? It is God's will to choose those who will exercise their free will and choose to believe in Him so that salvation in the end is of Him who wills. What is the cross? It is the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ which is made effectual for all those who exercise their free will and choose to accept that sacrifice salvation conditioned upon the will of man the whole system in the end it revolves around man's will and that's not surprising right from the very beginning in his pastorate in Amsterdam Arminius began creating suspicion in two ways first of all when he was sympathetic to the other ministers in the reformed churches who were controverting the doctrine of predestination taught by Calvin and Beza God's sovereign will and salvation. And then when he started preaching on the book of Romans and he came to chapter 7, as we heard last night, and started teaching that the natural will of the sinner has some good. Will of man, will of God. What is salvation? Is it all of the will of God? Or is it also, at least in part, of the will of man? What is the source of salvation from the very beginning? Arminius turned away from the sovereign will of God and he turned unto the will of man and developed, especially his disciples after him, developed this whole system that ultimately is a system in which everything revolves around man's will. And upon reading the canons, it's plain to everyone that the Senate is not rejecting a handful of of erroneous statements, some stray statements maybe made by Arminius or another. But the Synod is comprehensively rejecting an entire system. Third, the Synod warred a good warfare with the canons by rejecting the Arminian error honorably. The soldiers at The Synod of Dortrecht were some of the bravest and most courageous soldiers that have ever taken the field of battle in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Fearless. Many in the government were against them and for Arminianism. And there they were before all the Arminians, fearless. But they were honorable men of God. How honorable was their carefulness The synod was not rash or hasty in its deliberation. It didn't operate on mere hearsay. Or here's a few statements one of these students has from one of his classes back at Leiden where Professor Arminius was the teacher. 
The Synod carefully studied the five articles of the Remonstrance which they drew up as their official position. And then the Synod repeatedly asked the Arminians to explain further their convictions. And finally, on December 17, at the 34th session, the Arminians delivered a written document which was an elaboration of their five points and is known as the Opinions of the Remonstrance. And when it came to write the canons, the Synod used these two documents to understand the Arminian position. They gave all of the delegates opportunity to voice their convictions on every single point. On Wednesday, January 30, some of the delegates voiced their concern that the pace was too tedious, but Synod decided to continue with its careful, methodical pace. How honorable was their carefulness. And the same care, as we heard this morning, would be shown in developing the positive formulation of the truth with the committee that was formed to draw up the concept canons, and then it was brought back. Everyone had opportunity to critique it for revision. Many critiques were given. It went back into committee, was revised, came back. More criticisms went back to the committee, came back to the floor of synod. The synod was so careful. And also how honorable was the patience of the delegates. The Arminians employed one tactic after another to delay the Synod. They disobeyed the orders of President Bogerman. When they were called to appear, they didn't appear. They lied. They were evasive. They dodged questions. They tried to solicit the favor of the States General. And yet the Synod continued patiently to give them opportunity to defend themselves and to prepare written statements of their objections to the confessions, so that they were not expelled until January 14, 16, 19, meaning the Synod put up with their shenanigans for two months. It would be some patience to put up with that kind of behavior for two days. Two days of Synod. Two weeks? They were not expelled until after two months. The Synod rejected Arminianism honorably, carefully, judiciously, patiently. Fourth, and finally, the Synod warred a good warfare with the canons by rejecting the Arminian error sharply. Throughout the canons, there is the use of the sharp tongue, the kind of tongue the Apostle used and our Lord Himself used to show how serious the error is. For example, the canons say that the Arminians deceive the simple, that their doctrine is gross error, that it brings again out of hell the Pelagian error, that it seeks to instill into the people the destructive poison of the Pelagian error, that it is to be equated with the proud heresy of Pelagius, and that it does as did the wicked Socinius, who was a heretic. The Senate also warred a good warfare with the canons by rejecting Arminianism because it is left for us who are gathered here 400 years later a monument and model for polemics in the church. There is no greater distaste in the church, broadly, in the church world, and in reputedly conservative, reformed, and Presbyterian churches, no greater distaste than for calling another man's doctrine or another church's doctrine error, and then taking the proper course of action and rejecting the error in the name of loving tolerance and not wanting to hurt feelings, rejecting error is absolutely reprehensible in the eyes of man. And in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. And in your flesh, there dwells no good thing. And in the flesh, I don't want to identify as 
error and reject error, but we learn from Dort that the defense of the truth demands rejecting error. Error is against God. Error is against the church of God and the communion of the church of God. Error is not dead. Error is not static. There's a spirit of error. A spirit that lives and moves. And if it's not rejected, it divides and it conquers. Bound by our vow before God and before man. In the formula of subscription, let us as office bearers, quote, exert ourselves in keeping the church free from such errors, end quote. Let's strive to keep the uncommon spirit of Dort alive after 400 years and reject all errors repugnant to the holy word of God, doing so authoritatively with the scripture and confessions, comprehensively rooting the whole error out, honorably, carefully, patiently, judiciously, and if necessary, sharply. And to all of the brethren gathered here from around the world to celebrate the spirit of truth at the Synod of Dort, go back to your homeland with the same spirit with which the delegates came to the great Synod. And that is a spirit of conviction to reject error. Let us be bold to reject error. And if we are friends, all of us together, friends, then we say to each other what friends say. And what every minister of the gospel says to his overseers above him, who are also his friends, what Arminius was not willing to say to his consistory in Amsterdam, we say, friends, if I ever teach error, even unwittingly, love God and love the church and love me enough to show me my error and demand that I reject it wholeheartedly. The Synod warred a good warfare with the canons by rejecting error. All that being said, and that's the bulk this morning, I want to conclude by using the remaining time to explain the most outstanding contribution of the canons as a polemical document, and that is its positive formulation of the truth in each of the five heads. Most people take the canons of Dort, and when they think of it as a polemical document, they think immediately of the rejection of errors, and that's so uncommon. And that needs to be emphasized because there's a hatred for rejecting error. It's important not only to state the truth, but to say about the error, no, be gone. But now let's look at this from a different point of view. The rejecting of the errors is important, but most important is the positive statement of the truth. On the one hand, it's hard to be negative. It's hard to reject. But on the other hand, looking at matters from a different point of view, it's not so difficult to be negative. It's not so difficult to be a parent and to say, no, no, you're not going there. You're not doing this. We don't do this for entertainment. You're not listening to that kind of music. You're not going to take that career. No, that's not so difficult. It is more difficult to be a parent and to say, yes, this is good, edifying entertainment for you. This is what you can do with your gifts and abilities. You have musical ability. This is how you can press your abilities into the service of God. It's more difficult to be positive. It's not so difficult to be a preacher and be negative, to preach sin, to make God's people feel guilty. That's not very difficult. To rail against heresy, to condemn wicked living, but sometimes it is more difficult to preach the positive, glorious truth of God and the life of the genuine Christian. 
Sometimes it's not so difficult to see error and to condemn error. Or even if we can't exactly figure out what's wrong with something, we sense it's wrong, can't quite put our finger on it, but sense it's wrong. That's not always so difficult. It's often more difficult to say positively with the right words, what is the truth? How do we express this? Ecclesiastes 5 verse 3, there's a time to break down and a time to build up. Nebuchadnezzar broke down the temple in one day. The Jews told Jesus it took our fathers 40 and 6 years to build it up. It's easy to tear down. It takes time. It's hard work to build up. The church in the world is the pillar and ground of the truth, holding up the glorious truth of God. It's easy to be negative and reject, but the church is not negative as a response against something. The church is positive. God is not a response to something. He is the I am that I am. Jesus Christ is not a response to something. He is the first Born of every creature, by whom and for whom all things were made, that He might have the preeminence. The truth is not a reaction to something. The truth is its own absolute principle. Error is a reaction to the truth. Arminianism is a reaction to the truth. Error cannot exist apart from the truth. First there is truth. And then there is error as a reaction to the truth. Truth can stand alone and it will into all eternity. Truth. Oftentimes people come to the PRCA. People come from the outside. This has been my experience. And they say so doctrinally you're against common grace. Right from 1924. Anti-common grace. You're against the well-meant offer. You are against conditions in the covenant and in salvation. And we say, yes, but let's understand it this way. We are for sovereign, particular, effectual grace. Or they look at the pamphlets on the rack and they do some reading and they say, so I see you're against labor union membership. You're against remarriage after divorce. You're against training your little children in the state public schools. You're against mothers working outside of the home and having a career. And we say, all right, good. You've done the reading. Let me put it this way. We are for submission to God and the employer. We are for the lifelong bond of marriage. We are for the home and the family, and for covenant education. Positive. Now the brilliance of the canons as a polemical document, and as a confession that was written with contributions from delegates all over Europe who didn't always necessarily agree on every single point of doctrine, the infralapsarians and the supralapsarians, the brilliance that is the Canons of Dort is its robust, positive explanation of the truth unanimously adopted. The Canons are positive. And being positive, they are so harmonious from beginning to end so that when you read the first section on election, you read preservation. And when you read the fifth head on preservation, you read election. All the doctrines of salvation are related. It's a system, one united whole. So doctrinally profound, so spiritually edifying and pastoral and heartwarming. How easy is it, it is to rail against Arminian free will? But listen to what the canons say positively. Heads 3 and 4, Article 16. So also this grace of regeneration does not treat men as senseless stocks and blocks, nor take away their will and its properties, neither does violence thereto, but spiritually quickens, heals, corrects, and at the same time sweetly and powerfully bends it, that where carnal rebellion and resistance formerly prevailed, 
a ready and sincere spiritual obedience begins to reign in which the true and spiritual restoration and freedom of our will consist. That's profound and beautiful and lovely. But that expresses the prayer of many and often a pastor. He's mistreating his wife. She's going after other men. This young man in the church being so rebellious and even slandering the church and this young woman dating against the admonition of her parents dating the unbeliever. Carnal rebellion and resistance prevail. There's a will there. And the great prayer to the God of salvation is Lord God take His will. Take her will and sweetly bend it. So that where carnal rebellion and resistance now prevail, a sincere spiritual obedience begins to reign. It must have been because of a shared love for these positive truths of God that when Bishop Hall fell ill, and reluctantly had to return home to Great Britain, he said, quote, there was no place on earth so like heaven as the Synod of Dort, end quote. The Synod was war. Intense war. But the Synod warred a good warfare with the canons because out of that warfare came what must come out of every controversy in the church of Jesus Christ. And God will see to it an advancement of our understanding of and our expression of and our appreciation for the positive heavenly truth of God's sovereign grace in salvation. Rejection of errors for the positive defining of the truth and the maintenance of that truth to the glory of our great God and the well-being of His church. Amen.